Bright light, brighter cricket. As it usually does, the first day of the Waker Test match produced an action-packed spectacle, the best advertisement for cricket on the Australian calendar. The day swung England's way, then Australia's, and then, thanks to Dorid Malan's first Test 100, back to England. The Waker ground again delivered. Little wonder that authorities have decided to put an end to it. This is the WACA's last test match, and if not for construction delays at the new ground over the river and near the casino, it would not have taken place here at all. The Waker has a personality, fast and loose, like no other cricket ground in the world, as a farewell gesture, it reminded the game of what it is throwing away. Winning his third toss of the series, Joe Root might have wished he had won the second. It was unthinkable, after Adelaide, for him to send Australia in. So in Perth, where the team batting first customarily struggles to cope with the unfamiliar bounce and pace, where first use is seldom a clear advantage, Root had no choice but to send his own men in. But if England were to stage a counter-offensive in the series, this had to be the time and, damn the risk, the place. Australia also started with racing hearts over the prospect of a wicket to suit their speed merchants. The waker comes with two warnings, however, reapply Sussa irregularly and it get carried away by the bounce. Accordingly, Mitchell Stark and Josh Hazelwood set out bowling very full, good enough to dismiss Alastair Cook, hanged dog in his 150th, but they crossed the fine line and over pitch to Mark Stoneman who clipped four boundaries before the patrons had found their places in the sun. In the sixth over, Hazelwood got one to leap at Stoneman, whereupon things got very interesting. Stoneman dropped a hand off his bat and fended blindly at the ball, his best Stuart broad impression. This pitch was in party mood. You only live once, and the Australians had had enough of their trademark bowling discipline. There was fun to be had here. But for whom? Stoneman and James Vince had more than their share of sketchy moments, but the airy slices flew to safety and the scoreboard kept rolling. Australia were generating constant excitement but it was England's total forging ahead. This is the flip side of the waker, every opportunity for the fast bowlers is also one for the batsmen. Again and again the Englishman found the boundary, piercing the covers or deflecting past the redundant fine leg. When Stark dropped too short, Tim Payne gave up buys because he was not 10 feet tall. Nathan Lyon gained no assistance, finding himself instead a target for England's aggression, and soon the Australian leadership was showing signs of concern, if not panic. In his second spell, Hazel would return to his strength. Patience must have been hard to find with all this thing and pop, but even in the fabled mid 1970s. Dennis Lillet and Jeff Thompson had to bide their time between wickets. Look at the scorecards, those tough old English roosters resisted thunderbolts for hours. It was time for Australia to respond.